What's good, everyone? Welcome to another episode of Conversations with Creators. Um, this is a series that we started where we have conversations with various creators all over the world and look at the world through their eyes. Um, today, we have a very special episode. Usually, we don't do these things on a Saturday, but today we have a very special episode with Simbarashe who has been shooting the Black Lives Matter protest over the last two weeks and has been published in the New York Times and um, has really been on the front lines capturing this whole movement. Um, we're going to bring him in and we're going to talk to him about his experience. We're going to uh, answer a few questions and, and share with us what it's been like on the on the front lines. So I'm pulling Simbarashi in right now. Yo, what's hey, good, what's, man? How's it going? Good, good. How are it's you? Good to see you, man. I haven't talked to you in a minute. I know it. It has. It has been a few, a few months. I would say. When was the last, I, last time I saw you? Was in? Was it in London? It was in uh, London. If you didn't go to Paris, then yeah, it was. Yeah, really remember I was passing by, and then I saw you real quick. Yeah. Um, well, thanks for doing this, bro. I really appreciate it. I know that you have a lot of, you know, it's really busy for you right now. And there's a lot of important things that, you know, you need to tend to. But, um, you know, we, we're excited to have this conversation with you. We think it's, you know, important to, to really dive into this and understand what it's like from a photography perspective and, and talk about like the power of imagery in a moment like this, and how creating stillness through still photos um, can really amplify the message and and, and all of that. So thanks for being on. I'm psyched about this conversation. Yeah, me too. Um, so yeah, let's, let's dive right into it. So tell us a little bit about what it's been like on the ground for you um, over these last two weeks. What is, what, is, what is the vibe like out there? Uh, well, I think that, you know, obviously like the first few days were just completely different than what it's been like since uh, just with, you know, everything that was going on primarily in uh, Minneapolis. And then once the protest started here in New York, uh, down in Brooklyn, it was like kind of popping off for like a few nights and then the curfew thing happened. Um, my experience has been just a little bit different because <laughs> mostly uh, I've been covering the, uh, the events during the day. I've been marching during the day. And uh, at this point, I would say that everything is like 95 to 98% like calm, peaceful, um, still like very well organized, I'd, I'd have to say. Um, but there was a point, at least through the middle of last week where like every single day, and especially when the curfew started, everything would be like really calm. And then like just the later it got in the day and like the closer that it got around to yeah. like sunset, you could just feel like anxiety is like just rising a little bit. Yeah. Um, but yeah, most of the protesters that I've been with uh, have been for the most part, super peaceful. Um, the police have had like, uh, it looks like some sort of, communication with organization with uh, the organizers and whatnot. Um, but like, you know, from a deep spiritual level, like just really just crazy. Like this March is completely different from the other, you know, the, the first Black Lives Matter marches that happened, you know, a few years ago, I think. Yeah. Um, because it, there seems to be this sort of collective spirit that, you know, people aren't just going to like, let this one go away in the way that, you know, previous protests and marches have gone. So, yeah. I've been hearing a little bit that a, a lot of that, actually, that it feels a little, that it feels different this time. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, I, even during the week, it's weird because, you know, two weeks in, you would think that maybe for the most part, like the protests would pretty much just sort of like die down during the week and maybe pick up again on the weekends or whatever. But I mean, I was at Washington Square Park ooh, two days ago, like in midday. And there was, you know, easily like a couple of thousand people there um, marched into West, the West Village. And by the time the march reached uh, the West Side Highway, like it was just way more people. Yeah. And so... Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, we we live near McCarran Park, so you know, every day they're they're having um, uh, protests or gatherings um, the, uh, over here as well. So we've been seeing it on the Brooklyn side. Um, but what what like what what prompted you to go out with your camera? What why were you you know what what was the decision behind that? Um, what was the sentiment behind that decision? So I started. From the from the very first time that I picked up a camera, like my whole passion with photography has been photographing people, and it started with photographing strangers. Um, so I guess the old school sort of the old school street photography, I, as you will, but I would sort of take it a step further and make it a point to actually uh, approach people, you know, that I wanted to photograph to get actual portraits of them. Mm -hmm. So I did that, you know, every single day for the first two years that I owned a camera. And so just in any sort of situation where, you know, there's going to be like a lot of people, and I'm not even just talking about like a protest, but just anything um, where I have a feeling that there'd be a lot of people around taking a camera is like really a second nature to me. I don't even think about it anymore. But does it, is this a particular situation, uh, a bit different? Does it feel more personal? Like, do you feel more of a responsibility to go and document? I feel more of a responsibility to stick with it every day, for sure. Um, when I first got my camera and started photographing strangers from jump, like, I used to have like some hard rules, you know, in my exercise that I still sort of follow to this day. So I think in terms of like the seriousness with which I take it, um, it's always, I'm always serious. Like when I go shoot, like, so the fact that this is a black lives matter uh, protest and that the circumstances that, you know, the unfortunate circumstances that this is happening, um, that in of itself, does not make it more serious for me from like a technical, from a technical standpoint, or even really from a, an ethical standpoint, it's more just the dedication of sticking with it, not just to shoot one day, but to shoot as long as I have the energy to walk, really. Yeah. And that in itself has probably has to be difficult. I mean, I'm, I, I assume that you're walking around with a bunch of gear um, and you're on your feet all day. Uh, well, actually, Atif, because we've worked together a few, like, I, I don't, travel with a lot of gear actually i'm super light so Word. usually for me it's like one camera and maybe an extra lens um i like to be able to run and it's weird that you know with the situation like these protests like being able to run is even more critical than it is in like you know a regular sort of uh walkabout situation but um yeah like i want to be light and, and i also want to make sure that I'm not having to think too much about the technical part of shooting. Like when I want to, when I go to March, I just want to be able to focus on who's there. What's the energy like? Uh, what is the message that the people at whatever particular March I'm at are wanting to convey? And am I able to photograph that in a way that corresponds with the message that they are um, trying to put out? So are you, how are you approaching this yourself? Are you, are you looking for portraits? Are you looking for moments, emotions, all the above? How are, what is your approach for, you know, when, when you walk out with your camera and you, uh, you know, get to the location, how do you think about stepping? Um, so I've said this to like good close friends. I mean, I'm not very good. My brain's not very good at multitasking. <laughs> so usually like my coverage at like these protests have been both like wide and individually focused, right? Um, for me, usually when I first show up, I, just, I start a bit further away from people. I just sort of want to take everything in at once. Yeah. and see it like as wide as possible, um, get a sense of, you know, how many people are there. And if I can try to find a way to frame everyone in a shot, obviously I'll do that. 
Um, context. What's that? Context. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, both context, uh, atmosphere, and uh, the overall energy. And then once I've sort of taken a few shots like that, at that particular point, once everyone starts uh, walking, I will almost always put myself right in the middle of the lane of people mm -hmm. and just sort of stand and let people like walk past me as I filter back all the way back through the queue. Um, and at that point, I'm usually like looking for um, signs. I'm looking for faces. I'm looking for uh, people who stand out, you know, amongst the sea of protesters. Um, it could be someone who is announcing really loud. It could be someone who has uh, a particular raw emotion on their face. It could be someone who uh, I might assume has never been a part of something like this ever in their life. And they're kind of looking around like, oh, snap, you know, right. so no agendas really just uh, I just want to be able to make it as human as possible. They're taking a very documentary approach to it and just capturing you know, the emotions and the, the, the moments that you're witnessing and are in front of you. Yeah. Well, when you, when you bring those images home and then look, look at them collectively, do you find yourself seeing a particular emotion rise above? Like, do you, do you see a particular emotion kind of run through all the images? I have a pretty good idea before I get home, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, you know, especially like when it comes to uh, portraiture, or let's just say like, especially when it comes to the, 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 like the point where I approach an individual and sort of like get close to them and like explicitly point my camera at them, like I'm taking your photo now, you know? Um, I can't really be like oblivious to what it is that a person is feeling or thinking, because then that would make my process of taking their photo you know, quite rude, I think. Insincere, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I'm sure you've probably seen some of that out in protest too, where it's just like, you know, there are photographers or whether they're hobbyists or professionals, doesn't really matter. You know, they go out and they, you can tell sort of like what's on their mind is like, oh man, I want to get like the coolest shot. And I, we don't have to talk about that right now, but you know what I mean? Like, no, no, it, it, I, I think that the, 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 that's, you know, that's one of the themes that I want to explore is intention. I think mm -hmm. intention as a, as a documentarian or a, as a photographer plays a really critical role in situations like these. So, you know, what you're, what you're, lead, you know, what you're leading to is that there it, it is the intention question. Like, why are you there with the camera? What is your intention of being here and documenting and capturing. Yeah. I think it's important, you know, to think about that. Do you, this is, this is probably, you know, one of the first movements of this scale where photography, where photography has been completely, you know, prevalent in society, right? Everyone has a phone that has a camera on it. Do you see that there are a lot of people out there capturing or is it more curated? There are a lot of people out there yeah. capturing sure mm. um as a matter of fact i think that uh it's probably split right there you know you go right down the middle maybe half of the people in the crowd are actively demonstrating meaning like they have their signs they're doing the chants um they're also doing what they can to rally the people around them right Yes, And then there's the other half of people, most of them just have like their cell phones, but yeah. are, you know, documenting things as they walk, things that they see, people, um, the police, if, you know, we cross the police. Um, I want to be careful and say that, you know, even those people who are documenting are doing everyone like a great service. Right. Right. The issue of intent is more that's more of a an issue and a discussion for those more one-on-one -on -one interactions and those situations where people are, let's say, just 
getting into other people's like personal space without any sort of regard for, you know, their feelings or any sort of respect. Right. But for everyone else, you know, if you think about from the point where the protest first started and there were these sort of like conflicting reports about looting and who's starting the looting and why are the police like physically getting involved with people to the point where everyone just started taking out their phones and documenting what was actually happening and happening in front of them um, really changed the entire narrative of these protests, right? Uh, to the point that maybe a lot of protesters who were on the fence about uh, being a bit more dangerous about the way that they demonstrate um, had to sort of reconsider what was best. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure that, you know, police departments across the country felt the same way. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, well, you you talked about getting in, in into people's spaces. When you're photographing out there, are you asking people for permission for the photo or are you shooting it and then letting them know that you shot it? What is your approach there? Because you know, the world that we kind of come from or the world that I know you from, which I guess I should give some context. Uh, I've known Simbarashe for many years now. He's probably, you know, the uh, a content creator that I've known the longest in New York City uh, since I started photographing. Like when me, Ali, and you were at Herrera, like that's when mm -hmm. we first became friends. Um, and I know you as a fashion photographer, right? That's how, a fashion and portrait photographer, sorry. Um, so in that world, there is little, um, little asking of permission. We just shoot the photo as long as people are aware that the photo is being taken. Do you think about it differently when, when you're in this situation that's more socially charged? Um, like I said, I, I, don't, I don't change the way that I shoot at the protest at all. Mm -hmm. um, it, to answer the question, um, but especially when on the days that I that I shoot where I'm let's say assigned to shoot um, by the publication, yeah, I'm less likely to ask because I can't really interfere with the actual demonstration at that point, right? Um, yes. If I'm if I'm there conducting myself as like a journalist and I sort of have to shoot it as a journalist. Um, but if I'm shooting on like my day off, my days off, um, sometimes I'll ask if I can take a portrait, not always. It really sort of depends on that energy that I sense from the person when I approach them. Right. Um, I'm not, I'm certainly not the photograph, the, the photographer that's going to come from around like someone's back and just sort of like, like pimp slap them with a photo. You know what I mean? Like I'm not taking anybody's by surprise. Like they see me coming, they see a camera in my hand. They understand like what my intent is, whether I ask them if I can take their portrait or not. I'll start there. The second thing I'll say is um, I'll never take a photograph of anybody who doesn't want to be photographed. And a person doesn't have to tell me that they don't want to be photographed for me to understand that they don't want to be photographed. This is about intuition, this is about paying attention, this is about just being respectful of the space that I'm around, right? Yeah. If I pick up my camera and point it at someone, you know, I'm, I'm a 6'2 black man, not everyone is going to say they don't want their photo taken to me, right? Mm -hmm. But I know if they want their photo taken or not. And if they don't, you know, if they say no, if they wave their hand or whatever, I, it's fine. And then on the times that specifically with portraits, one-on-one -on -one portraits, um, there are a lot of times where I think it's appropriate to get a portrait, but I need to make, I, what I want is to capture them as naturally as possible. So tipping them off to the fact that I want to take their portrait sort of, it either ruins the moment or it then makes the photo that I capture inauthentic. And I don't want any of my photos to be inauthentic. So on the occasions where I will take a portrait of someone, but it is more of a, a candid portrait. And this isn't just something with uh, protests. This is something that I've been doing for years and years and years and years and years. And more photographers should definitely do it. 
I will just thank them for letting me do it. You know what I mean? Like if I come up to you, Atif, during a, a, a protest and you're standing there and your fist is in the air and you're holding a sign and we make eye contact, but maybe you're chanting. I'm not going to sit there and interrupt your energy and what you're doing. But if yeah. I pick up my, if I pick up my camera and point it at you and you don't change your, your, your sense of presence, right? That is sort of a implicit consent. I would say if I take your photo at that point. I will certainly thank you before I walk away. I always do that. Yeah. I think you bring up a really good point because when we have these conversations about permission or consent, you know, people always assume that it has to be done in this like verbal, can I take your photo away? But there are, you know, body language is really important. Eye contact is important. And the way that you approach somebody holding the camera up may be enough of a gesture to get permission if somebody doesn't block you right there. And you know, when I talk about consent and permission in photography, that's what I mean, because I align with what you're saying about the moment. And, and when, when you interfere with that moment, you're creating inauthenticity. Yeah. But, the, but, but, but I agree with you. Thanking, thanking the subject, if possible, is incredibly important. And we, we, we try to do that in every scenario that we're in, whether it's backstage at a photo shoot or if it's on the street, just taking a photo. As long as we've had that moment of like, yes, it's okay to take my photo. We yeah. take the photo and then afterwards, even the thank you could even be a nod or it can be an eye gesture. You know, it doesn't yeah. really have to be like a high five or a verbal thank you. And, so, and, the, and the other thing I would say to that too, and this is something that I think uh, a lot of photographers who maybe don't, there are a lot of photographers who will photograph a person and then refuse to make eye contact and maybe just walk away really fast like nothing happened, right? And if you're one of those people who have ever done that, then you try to put yourself in the, in, the, in the shoes of the subject that you've just photographed, right? Like, let's just say that happens to us, right? Yeah. Like, we're like WTF. Like, wait, why did that person just take my photo? Like, right what are they going to do with that photo? Like, what right. was I doing that I wasn't paying attention to doing with that photo, right? It, it yeah. feels more insidious. Um, whereas when you make that eye contact or if you just make the gesture to the person that I've acknowledged, like we've made like a joint sort of acknowledgement that this was okay. Um, I think it goes a long way to putting people at ease. And the other part of that, and I'll shut up, <laughs> is... Nah going when you're doing this in a protest march when there's just hundreds or thousands of people around and you're photographing enough people if you have the right etiquette those other people see and understand like what it is that you're doing whether or whether you're shooting them or not right right so there could be times where i'll photograph someone go to the other side of the crowd maybe 30 minutes an hour later i'll come back and photograph someone for people away from the first person that I photographed, right? Well, they've already seen me working throughout the crowd and they have been able to see like what my body language is and how it is that I interact with the protesters and whether or not I'm interfering or whether or not I'm making it sort of uh, about me or whatever. So it makes it a lot easier for everyone to sort of be comfortable when they have a better understanding of like what it is that I'm there to do. 100%. It's, it's, it's the same kind of idea of how you move around a room. You know, if you're in a closed space and people, people, people can see you doing your thing. And once you approach them, if they like the way that you are moving, they'll have no problem with welcoming you to take that photo. Yeah. Um, so that's, you know, that, that's, that, that's a really good point. And I think people out there that are shooting these protests need to be conscious of that, that it's not as, you know, you, doing drive-bys is not the move. You know, you have to figure out a way to, to be polite and, and to interact in a way that's responsible. Yeah. Were there any moments where you found yourself putting the camera down and engaging with what was happening? Like, where, do, you, do moments stick out in your head where you were like, this is more important than a photograph and I, I, I need to, you know, be a part of that? It happens like all the time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. That, that's a good, you know, that, that's it happens a good, all the time. This means like, you're human and you care more, you know, you care about more things than just the photo. Yeah, yeah. 
It happens all the time. Um, And every time that it happens, it's obviously like, it's a different place. It's a different situation. It's a different group of people. So the way that I react is, uh, is very different. Um, but again, like I have to be careful, you know, if I'm on the days that I'm conducting myself as a journalist, like I have to be careful. So even if I want to join in on the demonstration, I might not join in on the demonstration, but I might certainly like put my camera down and just sort of soak up the moment or make eye contact with the people who are standing around me and just be like, you know what? I see you guys. Thank mm -hmm. you for being here. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so it just depends on the situation on the day. I feel you. I want to talk about this, 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 this new kind of idea that has emerged um, during this particular movement and that has been the blurring of faces in photographs um, that are published on social media. Mm -hmm. So there's two schools of thought um, on this. One of it is that, you know, it's we need to protect the protesters and blurring out the faces in any photograph that's being pushed out is absolutely necessary. And then there's another um, side to this. Uh, a lot of photojournalists kind of align with this and which is you know, the erasure of faces during an incredibly powerful movement like this is dangerous. And it's also the, the power of the image is, is kind of diminished. The, the, what, what the image can accomplish, the good that the image can do, um, you lower that energy of it because there are no faces to identify with, to connect with, to, to really build a relationship with that moment that was photographed. So what do you feel about this since you're, one, you're shooting for yourself, but you're also shooting for a publication. So how do you, how do you, how are you thinking about this? Um, it's real simple for me. I mean, the analogy that I use for people who DM me and ask me about this is like, um, it's basically like stormtroopers in Star Wars, right? Over the entire course of that. You're about franchise. to make an analogy that I'm not, not going to understand. <laughs> well, so, you know, you know, <laughs> keep going, keep you, going. Know the, you know, the stormtroopers, right? You know what a stormtrooper looks like. The They're like in the, the white suits and okay. like the helmets and, you know, Guys, so over the course of Star Wars. So there you go. Well, we're not going to get into like the minutia of it, but yeah, basically over the course of that entire franchise for like oh, 40 years, right? 40 plus years, millions and millions and millions of stormtroopers die. Nobody's ever sad when a stormtrooper dies because they don't have faces. Mm. Uh, likewise, when you think about uh, the civil rights march, right, in the 50s and 60s, the civil rights movement, what connects with people are being able to see the images of hundreds and thousands of people who marched hundreds of miles from city to city, who staged sit-ins, who had German shepherds, you know, seeked on them by the police, who were hosed down by fire hydrants, yeah. who wouldn't move to the back of the bus, um, who would stand up in front of a church congregation and deliver speeches so powerful that we, kind of learn about them in school today, right? Talking about Dr. King. Um, we know all of their faces. And because we know all of their faces, we understand what the human toll is of the sacrifices that they made. You know, the number of people who were lost. Um, it's one thing to just learn about the Jewish Holocaust during World War II in a textbook that doesn't have photos and you just have a bunch of numbers, right? It's another thing to be able to see the sort of pain and horror and suffering that they endured. I'm... I'm never, ever, 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 ever going to blur out the faces of people who are standing up for what's, what's right. 
the only the only exception I think that I would make to something like this, and I still wouldn't blur it out. Under no circumstances would I blur out a fo- like a photo or an image, right? But if I was in an area or if I was in a situation where something was happening and I felt that the identity of the individuals in this photo would be, it would be dangerous for, like immediately dangerous for people to, let's say, know who whoever's involved in the action, right? Like, mm-hmm. I'm not going to take photos of people looting. I'm not going to take photos of people engaging in illicit activity. And if anyone asks me, like, why not, Simarashi, then I'd be like, well, there's 10 kids over here with a cell phone who are uploading it to Twitter and Instagram as we speak. Like, you don't need me to do that. Like, my job is to... make the more human side of the experience something that is relatable to to the people who see the content i hope that made sense no it does make sense it absolutely makes sense and you know in the beginning when this this narrative first began you know as as somebody who's been a student of photography since high school like i had a you know i had a problem with it but i didn't think it was my place to kind of speak to it right away i needed to think about it and educate myself a bit more and um really you know come from a place of of uh, understanding uh, in the beginning i was saying that too like you should be blurring faces out but as the more i thought about it the more that i've had conversations with uh, photo journalists with photo editors with uh with other people that are out, you know uh, part of that world it it they they've expressed you know similar uh a similar sentiment as you that the erasure of faces is 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 dangerous it's historically you know like something that will work against the the point of the movement and the message of the movement um so it's it's so you know what do you so you're you're on the side of no one should blur faces or that you just don't and everyone should do what they feel <laughs> well that's dangerous to say I, and i don't want to be like everybody should do what they feel I, again like I feel like there are, the situation is only complicated by the activity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And specifically when it comes to peaceful protests, uh, legally organized protests, even if they're not even legally organized, just like exercising one's right to assembly, you know, these are constitutional rights that we have here in the United States, right? Mm -hmm. If people are exercising their constitutional right then my feeling is if you hide the truth, then there is no truth. Mm -hmm. The only place for me where it would get a little bit more complicated is when people are exercising things outside of whatever their constitutional rights are. That would be, you know, if people decide that they want to set fire to um, a police precinct and I'm sitting there, like I, I'm not going to photograph the faces of the people who do that thing. I might right. photograph the building, but right. yeah, it, it's again. It goes back to the intention. Yeah, I think that it, you know that that that's been a you know important theme that keeps coming up. And what we're talking about is the intention of why you're there and what you're photographing and why you're doing it. Um. Yeah. All right. I, I think that that's, you know, it's, it's, I, I want to have more of these conversations. I think that it's really important for everyone to be educated on it. I think that in, in, in general, maybe it's, it's good for this sentiment to be out because not everyone is a responsible photographer. Not everyone knows, you know, what they should and should not be doing. So if, if, if you're, you know, if you're having trouble with figuring it out, maybe it's best to just blur it. But if your intentions are it, it, based on your intentions, I feel like I guess that that call needs to be made. But um, yeah, I think it, I think to just piggyback on what you said for a second, I, I think that if if you are going to uh, a protest march with a camera and you don't know what your intentions are, you should probably not take photos until you do. Yeah. I, I mean, I, as simple as that. I, I, we don't need, and why, by we, I mean just we as like a collective people, like we don't need mixed messages 
And the protesters certainly don't need to be interfered with, you know, by people who might not understand the etiquette of respecting space mm -hmm. and allowing them to do what they showed up to do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Agreed. Um, so, guys, everyone who's in here right now, if you have any questions for Simbarashi, please, please add them in the chat. We'll get to them in a few minutes. I wanted to talk about um, mental health and you know how are you handling yourself um emotionally this was a question that carolina who's in the chat right now posed um and she wanted to ask like how do you, how are you handling yourself mentally and emotionally when this is you know a personal experience for you not only photography but being black and and everything that's going on how do you how are you dealing with that um, I would say to Carolina, the first seven or eight days were, it was some of like the most difficult days of my life, if I'm gonna be honest, like, um, real talk, man, you know, we can talk about the emotional stress and weight of everything that's been going on. And I think a lot of people have been expressing that over the past few weeks, especially uh, black people, people of color, um, people of coming from underserved groups. Um, but for me, there was also this, there was also this toll that wasn't emotional at all. It was like purely physical and mental. Um, getting up and marching, you know, six to 10 miles a day. Um, and for the duration of those marches, you know, you are just hearing at maximum decibel levels, how much people are frustrated with the police, and how fed up they are with the justice system, and how fed up, you know, we as black people are for being like marginalized in this society. And so it's sort of like you're just getting pummeled and pummeled and pummeled with the message like day after day. And then in addition to that, you know, I get home and there's whew, maybe a hundred messages in my DMs, which I mean, I think it's great that everybody reaches out and they want to discuss things. Um, but but especially having to answer like sort of the same questions over and over. I'm not complaining, but just like having the same, like answer the same questions over and over just about like from people who just had no idea even in 2020 that like this stuff was going on with us. Mm -hmm. So it was just like, there was no point at which my brain could turn off or my body could sort of recover. And there was like a three day stretch where I literally was getting like two hours of sleep. Like I just could not sleep because my brain wouldn't turn off. It was just like playing these messages and loops and loops like through my head. And it was like, it was crazy, crazy. Uh, but after like seven or eight days, um, I just woke up one day and then my body just sort of understood what it was that it had to deal with. And I went out marching and maybe halfway through the march, my body just sort of said very consciously, oh, I know how to reserve energy for you now, you know? And mm -hmm. I started to sort of modulate in a way that I wasn't the first week. So uh, Caroline, like, now I'm good, thanks. Everything's good. I'm healthy still, thank God. Um, but it was, it was really tough. It, like, I don't, I've never experienced anything quite, quite like that. And that was before even having to deal, like think about what these demonstrations and marches meant for me as like, a black man, right? Like we didn't even get to that point. I don't even think I had time to think about that. Have you had yeah. time to? Um, I don't know. To be honest, I don't, I don't know. No, that's um, okay. You know, like that's, you know, that's legit. That's legit. Yeah. I don't know. Do you, it, what does the editing process look like? Once you're done with the, with taking the photos, you come back home, 
you dump everything, you start looking at it, looking through it. What is what does that look like? Is it is it an emotional experience? Once I'm home, I have learned to find a good like a I've learned to find a way to not really turn off and disconnect, but my my perspective just sort of shifts. Like I think all of the emotions and whatnot that I deal with are usually like during during the march. And when I hop on a bike or get on the train to go home at that point, it's just like a really long exhale until I get home. So I'm a lot more calm. And the editing process uh, for me is, I mean, I don't know if you know this, like, I mean, we're personal friends, but like, my editing process is pretty quick. Um, I usually know what I want as I'm shooting. So it's just a matter of going in and finding those images. I don't usually spend time like combing over all of my images. I don't do that. Um, I put my photos through two really, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead, go ahead. No, I don't want to. Oh, I was just going to say, I put my photos through two really quick passes, like really quick um, because I, I shoot a lot on analog film, not nothing for the, the demonstrations, but just like with my fashion work and whatnot. I shoot a lot on film and with film, you know, when the, the stuff is developed, like it, there's not much to be done with those images after that for me. Mm -hmm. So I try to use that same sort of discipline with my digital images. And uh, I don't shoot a lot on burst. So, you know, even if I'm doing like a 10 mile walk, you know, I don't come home with like six, 7,000 raw images i don't yeah i mean that's the way to go it'd be it'll, it'll, <laughs> <laughs> i imagine it would be incredibly difficult to go through like thousands of photos but it seems like when you take the photo you, you kind of remember that moment and when you go to edit it you look for that moment yeah. um, to pull out especially if you don't overshoot it just yeah. makes it easier yeah that's it just makes it easier that's such a film photography mentality, you know, like you, you have to remember what you shot. And then because you can't, you can't like, you can't review it on the camera right away. You can't burst mode, shoot like 30 images. Uh -uh. I mean, you can, but I don't like, I just don't like to do that. I don't No, I'm saying like with film, you can't really do that. Oh, no, no, not at, at mentality. all. Not at all. Like, every every yeah. time you press a button, it costs you money, right? It costs yeah. somebody money. So <laughs> have you been shooting any film or all digital? It's just been all digital. Um, you know, if I get picked up and assigned uh, for the day by, let's say, like the Times, um, I just want to make sure that, like, I'm both doing a good job for them and that I'm also representing and serving the people that I'm documenting, like, as best as I could. And that's not to say that there's anything wrong with shooting both film and digital at, uh, at a demonstration. Um, yeah. It's just that my responsibility is just a bit different. That's all. For sure, for sure. I would if I could. Do you have a Do you have a particular photo you shot that is the most impactful for you? Wow! I, I mean, this question in advance, and I could have picked something. Um, um, th th there's a couple. Um, there was an image that I, that I took on, uh, Central Park West that was, uh, of a black man holding his child. I think mm -hmm. I rendered that in black and white. Uh, that's the one that probably sticks out immediately. Mm. Um, there was a photo that I took on the first day on the FDR hi highway where like there's a pedestrian overpass where there's these people who are sitting all standing across on the top of the overpass watching the protesters sort of take over the highway. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's this, the one that I took on the funeral march in Harlem where it was just all of the black people of Harlem who wore their Sunday best clothes and came down on Park Avenue and just, you know, all had their fists up in the air and there was like the road was going up a hill. So I was able to like photograph everyone going up the hill. Um, those are like the three moments that really stand out to me the most. No, that makes sense. Um, I really love that image of the man kneeling with his hand up and it's just his back. 
the photo that we we posted oh, with the bicycle yeah. yeah I really really love that photo I just you know you don't even see his face and there's I, I feel so much emotion pouring out of that photo and uh, I don't know I just connected with that as soon as I saw it I didn't even know it was your photo when I first saw it uh, oh. where I saw it and I was like wow this is an incredible photo I really love it um, um, okay cool so I mean we're, we're, we're kind of wrapping up now just want to ask you two more questions one do you have any advice for people that are grabbing a camera and going out um, shooting at protest have you seen anything that you feel like needs to be addressed as like these are not this is not the way or any best practices that you can share so people can be more informed when they're out there shooting? So I'm, I'm only going to speak to New York because I'm in New York. I don't know yeah. sort of who's, I don't know how the organizations of the marches are going in other cities, but in New York, there is a really great resource for anybody who doesn't know. It's um, justice for George NYC at Justice for George NYC is the Instagram handle. Uh, they do a really great job of putting the next day's um, march and demonstration events on their profile. And usually Twitter picks that up and then they re-aggregate it. So by the next morning, everybody knows what's happening. The reason why I bring that one up is because um, they usually do a really good job of putting a description in what kind of demonstration they are, right? So not every demonstration is a march. Um, sometimes it's a rally. Sometimes it's a press conference. Sometimes it's like a quiet vigil. Um, sometimes it's a bike ride. I, knowing the kind of event that you're going to uh, join or participate in is really important because it tells you immediately sort of like what the mood of the event is going to be and what sort of to expect. So, you know, if you're an aspiring photographer who wants to go and maybe take a bunch of portraits of people, uh, on one hand, you might think that the quiet visual is a place to do it because everybody is in one place and everything is calm, but you may not realize that people may be like way more vulnerable there and it might not be like the best etiquette to sort of go to photograph like an event like that where people really just want to be with their space and deal with their pain and suffering mm -hmm. like privately amongst other people. So that's a really good that, Yeah. So just sort of being aware of what the sort of March is or what the protest is, right. um, is really helpful. And aside from that, um, I think, I think the next best advice that I can give, is if you are a person who has not photographed or you, you want to come photograph like a demonstration, please, please, please come to multiple ones. Like, and maybe not try to photograph the first one that you go to, like come demonstrate, see what it's like, see what the people are like, understand what the flow of space and energy is like. Um, and then when you sort of, and even maybe just, watch what the other photographers are doing and just sort of get to know your surroundings and get to know the ins and out of, you know, how the protest works. So that when you do bring your camera, you know how to like not either be in the way or not to, you know, make someone aggravated. Those are the two things that I would say. I, I love the second point that you made. I think it's really important. Um, you know, I, 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 I would pose the question, like, would you be there if you didn't have the camera? Exactly. Um, and if the answer is no, then you shouldn't go and photograph it. Yeah. Um, so that that's a really important point. Listen, man, I really appreciate your time. This was a really great conversation. Like I, 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 I champion what you're doing right now because I believe in the power of imagery and I believe, you know, the, that, that images make a difference, that photographs have the ability to, to create change and to, and we've seen this happen throughout history. And now it may feel like it's not as impactful because we're living in this era of social media and there's so much imagery around us all the time. But because there, there's, because we're saturated with Im imagery, we need people like you out there capturing these moments in a, in a, in a you know, in a strong way and telling it, telling the story from your perspective. So thank you 
you know, for your time now and for being out there and photographing. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. And uh, I just want to say to anyone out there, you know, if you live in a place where there are demonstrations happening and you believe in what these demonstrations are about, if you've not gone out to march and demonstrate, you know, you are exercising your constitutional right to do so. We don't really get this many opportunities in life. Um, so I would certainly encourage people to support any way they can, whether it's coming out to march or um, donating or whatever you can do, like just the smallest bit that you can do if everybody chips in uh, would just mean a, like so much to so many people. Amazing. And on, and on that note, we'll end this. Thank you so much, man. Really appreciate it. No problem. Have a good weekend. You too, bro. Bye-bye.